guests of the solar system tonight. Um, and to introduce him, I'm going to introduce uh, one of our newer board members, Cynthia Blankenship, who will introduce Mike. Thank you, Cynthia. Hi, everybody. Is this working okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, so thank you, John. As John mentioned, I'm uh, one of the newest board members of the geologist at Jackson Hole. I hold a uh, undergraduate and graduate degree in geology, and I spent the last 30 years in the oil and gas industry. And a um, little advertisement, I'm going to be doing a talk next month on the geology of the Gulf of Mexico, so please plan to come to that. Um, and I'm also really pleased to introduce Mike. So Mike Adler um, has done a lot of talks here, and you probably know him better than I do, because he's been talking here since before I moved to Jackson Hole a year and a half ago. <laughs> uh, but if, in case you don't, Mike graduated with a PhD from MIT in 1971, and from there went on uh, in the area of solid state physics, and from there went on to work at General Electric in 1971 until he retired in the year 2000. Nice symmetry there. Um, he's widely published in the area of semiconductor physics with over 100 papers, and based on this, he's a fellow of the IEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. The IEE is the largest technical society in the world with over 400,000 members in 160 countries. Mike has been active in the IEE for 30 years and was the IEE president in 2003. More than that, Mike has been pursuing his hobbies of astronomy and photography as well as traveling with his wife, Virginia, and they um, do two not one, but two trips of a lifetime every year. How cool is that, right? Um, one, on the astronomy front, um, in 2014, Mike built an observatory in his home here in Wyoming that houses new 20-inch and 12.5-inch telescopes along with his 6-inch refractor. And in 2012, he had a two-month exhibit of his ast ast astrophotography as the inaugural exhibit in the new exhibit hall here in this library. And in February and March in 2017, he gave another exhibit at this library of 30 new images. Now this bio that I don't have, that I have, doesn't actually even mention the eclipse photo photographs that are absolutely stunning that he took, so go check those out. Uh, what's the website for those? Yeah, it's uh, uh, wyomingstargazing.org. Uh, yeah, amazing, just amazing. Um, and Mike has been giving talks on a number of topics in astronomy, geology, and travel to groups in New York and to the Astronomy and Geology Clubs in Jackson, as well as the Armchair Adventure Series in Jackson. And so I think actually tonight we're in for a real treat because Mike is going to tell us all about Pluto and Mars. Yeah. So okay. thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Cynthia. Appreciate it. Okay. talk about uh, uh, Pluto and Mars, uh, obviously been in the news a lot uh, with the various expeditions. And um, uh, we're going to start with Pluto. And one of the interesting things that's a common to, uh, to is water. And you never think, water on Pluto? Give me a break. Water on Mars, we know, uh, is, is obviously in the news a lot. Uh, and it's been the big question, is there any water on Mars either? But there's a question about water on Pluto too. Anyway, this is the story. Um, it, uh, it took 10 years and 3 billion miles for the uh, New Horizons satellite uh, to uh, get uh, all the way out to Pluto, did a little spin around uh, Jupiter on the way. Um, just to give you a little feeling for the, uh, the whole thing, it took 10 years to get there, it was over in 6 hours, but um, <laughs> it's a little, a little brutal. But, so here's the final approach uh, at 11 o'clock, this was on uh, July 14th, at 11 o'clock, it was uh, on uh, here, here, it passed through the uh, plane of the planets and uh, the moons. Uh, at 12 o'clock, it was as close to Pluto, and then uh, then just about 1 o'clock, it's close to Charon, and then it's out of there. So uh, this picture here was taken uh, one day before when it was still 2 million kilometers away. And you can see the, uh, the thin atmosphere uh, around the uh, planet. Um, and this is a picture taken uh, right after, uh, during the close uh, encounter, and now you can see this thin atmosphere, 20 layers worth of it. Um, 
a little bit of uh, uh, Pluto ease. Uh, this particular uh, uh, encounter occurred during the north summer solstice. And uh, Pluto is really tipped over by 120 degrees, and the North Pole is actually pointing down. Um, and uh, and but so in this time, you're going to see the the whole north side of the planet was illuminated. The southern half isn't. Pluto's year is 246 Earth years, and it's going to be another 100 years before the south side gets any sun. So <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Here's a, a nice globe uh, that was taken by the uh, New Horizons. Uh, this uh, particular feature of this heart-shaped feature is known as the Tombo Regio. It was the first item noticed. It was seen a month, uh, I think a full month before the, uh, the uh, close encounter. Here's a, some of the other highlights we're going to talk about in this talk. Uh, the Chultno Regio, uh, these, uh, these mountains, uh, Hillary and uh, Norgay, and the Prune Macula, and the Sputnik Planum, which is the flattish part of this uh, the tombo. And it was interesting that the, uh, the, the Sputnik was thought first to be uh, a, a raised area. It's now known to be three to four kilometers below the surface. So it was, uh, uh, it's now the plenum, not a plantia. Um, the, uh, these particular, okay, here's just another slightly different picture, but uh, the images uh, show a lot of red, and that's thought to be uh, made of a material called theolins which are formed by exposure of UV uh, and thought to be a precursor to life and it's located mainly on the outer planets. Um, another aspect of it was a more uh, accurate measurement of size of Pluto. So Pluto regains its number one status in the Kuiper belt. It's no longer, still, it's still not considered a planet anymore, but it's the largest item by just a bit. It's now uh, uh, bigger than uh, the uh, second, what, the second uh, Eris. Uh, based on the measurements and the weight size, uh, it's about 35% ice and 65% rock. All over the entire surface is all ice of one form or another, either water, nitrogen, methane, or uh, carbon. This is actually uh, showing where these various uh, frozen gases are located, uh, and uh, scientists don't know why this, they're all located where they are, but that's where they are. Um, Here's a, a, one of the uh, big surprises, and this is where the water story comes in here. Um, one of the big surprises is the smoothness of the Sputnik Plantia. And at first they saw, thought that, well, that's probably evidence that it's no older than 10 uh, million years because there's no uh, craters on it. But um, as, as we got closer, we started noticing these, um, the scientists started noticing these polygons, which are on the order of about 10 to 40 kilometers across. And uh, these are evidence that uh, Pluto is not dead, it's quite alive, and, uh, and there's heating going on, and these are sort of solid state bubbles of nitrogen flowing up from uh, the uh, inside of the planet. Uh, and uh, uh, nitrogen melts at, um, uh, at th uh, 37, so at, at, well, at 63, so at 37 it's frozen, but it's still somewhat fluid, and so, there's actually motion. They've detected motion of a few centimeters a year of the uh, of these uh, of these. So based on that, we know we know not, it's not just younger than 10 million years. It's younger than probably 500,000 or maybe even less. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and so because of this and the smoothness of it, and they know there's uh, some energy underneath here causing these bubbles that come up, there was a speculation that there's maybe a buried water layer under here. In addition, uh, this particular area of Pluto uh, right here is uh, right opposite where the, the large moon Charon is located. They're tidally locked. So Charon and Pluto face each other, and this is the spot they face each other on. So it's thinking that this may be a higher density area of the planet, and that adds further evidence to the, or at least further conjecture to the possibility that there is liquid water, and the estimate is about 100 kilometers of it, potentially underneath the surface, uh, about 30% of, of containing salt, similar to the Dead Sea. And so this, this was not something that they realized at the time of this. This is, this is and several years after the, uh, that this analysis has occurred, that has come to this conclusion. And uh, further, again, other papers, if you notice, uh, I'll try to put these things, if anyone is really interested, 
they're all footnoted, so all the references on the talk are footnoted. Um, but uh, so further analysis suggested that well, we know heat is moving up because these uh, these hydrogen these nitrogen bubbles are are happening, and so the thinking is that there could very well be a liquid layer underneath that this uh, that this uh, that the heat uh, has melted the uh, water, and suggest as suggested in the previous uh, view graph. Uh, but the question is, is it frozen uh, or is it not? And the thinking is, it's not frozen because if it was frozen, it liquid once and frozen now, there should have been a huge uh, 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 compressional fracture on the planet and there isn't any. So the thinking is, it, there, it is probably in this layer uh, of 100 kilometers uh, of water uh, or salty water underneath the surface. Another sort of uh, thing that builds credence that it's not, clear. this is a picture, this is a, uh, because of the time constraints, I'm going to uh, only talk about Charon with this one view graph. This is a very nice, uh, very nice image of it. It's, um, th there's this huge crack that goes right across the, uh, the moon. And it's uh, 50 kilometers uh, wide, five kilometers deep. And um, it's, uh, and it reaches seven kilometers deep. This is thought to have occurred because uh, Charon, uh, the center, the water that was once below the surface froze and caused the uh, planet to expand, and this crack was the result of it. And so this has happened on uh, Charon. It hasn't happened on Pluto. So that's the thinking that the liquid is probably still uh, liquid. Uh, water is still liquid on Pluto itself. Um, and uh, looking at um, these two other areas um, that were, if you recall, they're very close to the, uh, uh, the Tombo Regio. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the mountains. From one thing uh, up in here, there's evidence of nitrogen flow. And so uh, that's, uh, that's further evidence of activity uh, from the center of the planet. In addition to that, there are these mountains. And uh, so they were analyzed uh, and they reflectivity measurements say they're not, they're not uh, rock. Uh, and since this is nitrogen, the only thing this can, these things can be, and they're about 11,000 feet above the uh, surface, the only thing they can be is water ice. So this, these, are, these are chunks of water 11,000 feet high floating in the sea of nitrogen. And nitrogen is, uh, water is uh, less dense than nitrogen, and so it makes sense that they would be floating. So, and they were named after Het Hillary and Norgay of uh, Everest uh, fame. Um, another another interesting things about the planet. These two other regions. This this is a region called the Croon Macula, which is uh, further uh, uh, to the right in that picture of the uh, Repia, and it's it's got these very interesting um, uh, pits that are about 13 kilometers across, maybe two and a half kilometers deep. These large pits. This is all ice of one form or another. On the other side, which is amazing, this is called the Chukna Regio. It's uh, four billion years old. So here you have Sputnik Planum, essentially active, continuously. And here's another region right next to it that's four billion years old. Pretty amazing. OK, Pluto's moons. All right, well, uh, Pluto, the theory is that uh, Pluto probably uh, had a bad collision, had a bad day once, uh, um, a bad hair day once, and, and uh, it, it, this uh, collision did several things. One is it created the, uh, uh, the moons, but it, and it caused Pluto to be tilted over like it is. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I've told you all I'm going to tell you about Charon, but the other, uh, there's four other moons, and they're very interesting. They're, they're not, they're very small. Uh, there aren't really good images of them. Uh, these are far better than anyone had before, of course, but uh, uh, the purpose really wasn't to photograph these. Uh, but they're all spinning, and uh, see, Charon is tidally locked, so it is not rotating around the planet. It is fixed, and it's just like our moon is fixed, uh, uh, tidally locked to uh, the Earth. These are spinning like crazy, and they're tipped over flat on the orbital plane. And this one, Hydra, spins 89 times during its 30-day uh, orbit. So they're just cranking around, spinning like crazy. So who knows? Uh, all right, so uh, that, is, uh, that is all we're going to talk about as far as Pluto goes. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot more that could be said. Um, 
as I mentioned, all the, I have references in the uh, in the talk, so if, uh, I'll make these available and you can take a look. All right, we're going to now talk about Mars, and the rest of the talk is going to be all on Mars. Um, okay, Mars, uh, one mission to Pluto, right? Forty-four missions to Mars. Um, Twenty-one of them were successful. Okay, so these go back into the '60s and even to the '50s. Uh, uh, the U.S. has had 21 missions, uh, which is, has five still going right now as we speak. 18 were successful, so most of the 21 are, are done by the U.S. The first successful mission occurred in 64, and this was the uh, 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 by the Mariner 4 flyby. It was not an orbital; it was a flyby, and they, they it got there and they took uh, uh, pictures and they were returned successfully. In 1971, uh, the, the USSR. Um, made the first lander, and it did live for a bit, not very long, but it did, it did survive. And then the next big milestone was in 97 with the Pathfinder, consisted of the lander uh, and uh, uh, this tiny little robot rover called Sojourner. Uh, and this was the first rover to occupy. But this, uh, this is the family tree uh, uh, of uh, all these missions, and uh, the flags, color of the flags indicate, you can see there's a lot of them by the USSR. Uh, in the past. This is a picture of the, uh, the three rovers. Uh, here we have the Sojourner, the little toy. This is an opportunity or spirit. Uh, there, there were two of them that were launched very close to each other in time, uh, 2004. And this is uh, the current uh, Curiosity, which is much bigger. It weighs a ton, uh, and it's the size of a, 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 an automobile. Okay, so where were all these things happening? What's happening? This is a map of, uh, of the surface of uh, Mars, and uh, we have um, <clears throat> we have this big blue area, which it doesn't mean there's water there, but we'll talk about that. There might have been water there, but anyway, it's way down. It's 27,500 feet below uh, the area over here. The uh, anything that's um, uh, red is 13,000 feet above. And uh, the white is 27,000 feet. These uh, volcanoes are 27,000 feet above uh, the plain, and uh, and these are you know these are uh, no, anyway. Then then the, the biggie here though is Olympus Mons, which is another volcano, and this thing is uh, 25,000 meters above the average uh, elevation on Mars. It's three times the height of Mount Everest. It's as big as the state of New Mexico. So, uh, so that's that's that's, that, and there's nothing else like it in, in the solar system. This is clearly the tallest thing in the solar system. It has two moons, uh, one called Fear, Phobos, and uh, Deimos, Panic. Phobos is slowly moving towards Mars and will eventually get ripped apart by tidal the tidal forces in an, in a mere 50 million years. Um, on the surface itself. Uh, we have uh, showing you where these things are. Curiosity is the Gale Crater is here. Spirit was here. Uh, the, the spirit of uh, uh, the opportunity. Here's the opportunity over here. Uh, there were the two Viking landers are were located up here in the northern pin, and then the Phoenix lander is is way up here. And I'll bring this back. Oh yeah, this is the Valles Marineris, which is the Grand Canyon of uh, of Mars, which is uh, is way bigger than. Uh, uh, well, it's huge, and we'll talk about that later, too. A little bit about Mars itself. Uh, here's Mars, here's the Earth. Uh, Mars is smaller. Uh, it has the same kind of uh, obliquity, uh, about the same. The day is about the same. The year is twice as long as the year on Earth. It's 667 uh, days. Uh, the sols are what are referred to as Martian days. Um, the sunlight is less, 44% uh, because of its distance. The atmosphere is very thin, it's mostly carbon dioxide, but it's, it's like 7% of the, uh, 7 tenths of a percent of the uh, atmosphere on the Earth. So it's very, the atmosphere is extremely thin. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a set of um, uh, plots that show a couple of things. One is, this is the yearly variation in temperature of Los Angeles. Okay, in this 20 C range. This is the yearly variation in weather uh, and temperature in the Gale Crater measured by Curiosity. And uh, Curiosity is measured 16 C, 60 F in the summer, and is as cold as minus uh, 
100 or a 148F in the in a winter evening. This is the humidity. This, this, uh, this one is the water content. Uh, and you can see in the summer months, uh, the humidity gets pretty high, even though the, the atmosphere is very thin, it can actually get humid. And in the winter, it can get so humid that frost can form. So it's uh, a little about the atmosphere. I mentioned that already. 95% uh, of it is uh, CO2, similar to Venus, but is 10,000 times thinner than Venus. Um, it, uh, it pretty clear from the measurement, this MAVEN is the newest of the satellites it was launched. Into. It was designed to look at the, uh, uh, at the atmosphere. And it's pretty clear that once Mars lost its um, magnetic field, it had a magnetic field originally, lasted about, uh, from, uh, about 500 million years. About 4 billion years ago, it, the iron in this core solidified, the magnetic dynamo died, and after that, um, the atmosphere of Mars was, was scraped away by the solar wind. And uh, MAVEN has made very detailed measurements of this, showing that uh, uh, it, it's all consistent with that. Called, they call, it's called sputtering. Now, with a, and a point here at the bottom is made is that with little atmosphere, Mars has undoubtedly gone through the greatest climate change in the history of any of the planets, because it went from, probably, we're going to make the case, it went from a very wet, a uh, semi-warm planet with a dense atmosphere to essentially a desert. Okay, so uh, here are the various uh, um, uh, missions that are currently active. There's the Mars Odyssey uh, 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 orbiter. It was launched in 2001. Its primary uh, uh, job was to study, uh, look for ice, buried ice using neutron uh, measurements. The Mars Express is, uh, was done by the uh, European Space Agency and we're, uh, NASA is partnering with that. But uh, it was designed to look at both the surface as well as the atmosphere. Their rovers were Mar launched in uh, uh, 2003, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so Opportunity was launched in 2003 and landed in 2004. Opportunity is still going 14 years. It's now into its 14th year. Saturn, a spirit got stuck in some sand and uh, died about seven years, but it was, um, it, it had a 90-day a, a designed life and has lasted uh, 14 years. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about this one. Uh, this was uh, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. This has a fantastic camera, the most highest powerful, most powerful camera uh, uh, ever on something other than the Earth or the Moon. Uh, and a lot of the images are done by that. And then there's the uh, MAVEN, which we talked about, studying the atmosphere. And then there's Curiosity, which is going to be the uh, centerfold of most of the rest of this talk. Uh, not all of it, but... Um, so here's a self-portrait. So how can you do a self-portrait? Um, it's a selfie. There's the arm. There's a robotic arm, and it's taking this picture. And that you see the shadow of the arm, but the arm is not visible in the picture. Uh, it's twice as long and five times as heavy as the, uh, as the, the earlier, uh, and it has a lot more scientific instruments on it. Uh, it's not actually looking for life on Mars, it wasn't equipped to that, but it's trying to determine whether life could have happened. It's collecting soil samples and rocks, and we'll talk about this, analyzing them for signs of life, building blocks, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, etc. And uh, it's looking at the uh, history of the atmosphere and uh, water, and also studying the geology, is how things uh, have happened and are happening on, on the planet. Um, okay, so a little bit about uh, the launch. This is the spacecraft. Um, the uh, Curiosity is embedded inside here. It, it, the whole thing weighed about 1.2 million pounds at liftoff. Uh, Curiosity itself, the rover is about 2,000 pounds. The, uh, the launch, the landing system weighed about 5,000 pounds and fuel of about 1,000. So th you're, most of you probably have, uh, uh, were involved or watched this happen. It was seven minutes of terror uh, as far as the, uh, or the people were um, managing this uh, at JPL. But it, uh, it, it, it came down using a combination of parachutes and then uh, a, a sky crane deployed and uh, dropped it to the last bit and then flew away. And the previous uh, rover's opportunity used an airbag, but Curiosity was too heavy for that, so they had to go through this rather incredible, elaborate 
scheme to do this. And it worked amazingly. Uh, okay, so here's another self-portrait. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> this was taken in 2015. You get an idea of the terrain around it. Um, this uh, red, reddish soil with lots of rocks. This is the summit of Mount Sharp uh, up here. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. The rover is able to go over about 30 inch items and uh, it can go at a screaming speed of 90 meters an hour. Um, it has a plutonium power source that's uh, estimated to live for about um, uh, uh, 14 <coughs> years. So these are the instruments on the uh, rover and I'm not going to go into great detail on these but I'll just quickly hit. There's a neutron source and detector for measuring water. There's uh, uh, up here, there's uh, something called APXS, which is an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. There are 17 cameras on the, on the rover. Nine are for navigation. Uh, the rest are for some form of imaging. The mass cam, which is uh, this thing here, has uh, a 34 and a 100 millimeter camera on it. There's a um, chem cam I'll talk about in a second. And there's a handheld uh, imaging device for sampling geologic samples so it's uh, it's on, I, excuse me it's on this uh, it's on the uh, uh, the, the arm here the retractable arm and then there's these uh, these two SAM and chemmen uh, chemistry and isotopes and mineralogy so uh, this is a uh, pretty amazing I'm going to talk about chemcam in the next slide but these are t these two out instruments can actually ingest the drilled powder so here's a hole uh, and the powder is select, put into these uh, 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 devices, test tubes if you want, and they're analyzed by both ChemMin, which measures mineral composition, and then SAM, which uh, looks at, uh, uh, I'll show you in a second what it does, but this is SAM right here, and it occupies half of the uh, science payload. So this is a, a typical, this is one of the measurements that was done uh, uh, by Curiosity uh, in, the, in the Cumberland hole, they call it, show you where that is. Uh, what they do is they, it heats the sample up. It has three instruments, a quadrupole mass spectrometer, a gas chromatograph, and a tunable laser spectrometer. Okay, And it searches for compounds. And you can see at different temperatures, they start appearing, and uh, as well as uh, 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 elements such as hydrogen, oxygen, etc. This, this one, this is interesting. This, this, is, uh, this is hard to believe, but this is ChemCam, and this is what it does. It shoots a laser beam at rock or soil at, at a range of up to 23 feet. It vaporizes something. Then it has a camera that looks at the uh, spectrum of the uh, of uh, the light that comes off of uh, off of it and analyzes what it's made of. That pretty amazing. So that, that's so that's kind of the whole story about um, of what Curiosity is and what it has on it. So it's really loaded uh, and it's able to do some amazing stuff, and it has. Because we're now five and a half years into Curiosities, and it's still going, as you'll see. Uh, this shows Mount Sharp right here in comparison with Mount Rainier, with uh, Mount McKinley, and Everest. So it's it sticks up about 18,000 feet above the, and it was chosen primarily because there were signs that it would have water, but it also, since it's in a, uh, it is a crater, there are many layers in the crater, and it provides uh, information about the geological history of Mars. So that was the reason it was chosen. It's about 100 miles across, uh, holds a mountain in the middle called uh, Aeolus Mons, aka Mount Sharp. Uh, and its uh, gale is about the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island together. Okay, so here's a picture, a nice picture of uh, from the high rise, by the way, satellite, and uh, showing uh, Gale Crater. And here's, this, here's Mount uh, Sharp. Um, this, this line right here uh, is, uh, is uh, it's called cemented features. This is the level that water probably rose uh, and uh, because the, the, the nature of, of the sediments above here are, are different than down below. This is Curiosity's path over five and a half years. Right here, it hasn't gone very far. It's not gonna go to the top. It's gonna go a little beyond where it is right now. And that's, yeah, that's two miles right there. Okay, so this uh, gives you a more detailed picture. Here's the landing site. Uh, the very first place where it spent seven months is not very far away. And then it comes zipping down parallel to the, this is all, uh, these are all sand dunes. And it, it, it comes down to here, and then somehow gets across these sand dunes and start, is climbing up Mount Sharp itself. 
this is the whole story, all the way from August 6, 2012, to January 30th. So this is this is hot data here. Uh, uh, January 30th this year, and uh, this is where Curiosity is right now. Um, well, five days ago. Uh, but uh, this is and they, the the team names all these sites uh, uh, all along the way, and it's it's marked by. Uh, various names, and you know, Old Soaker, Mount Desert Island, if you're from Maine, uh, there's names here that reflect uh, geography all across the country and the world. This is a little more detailed, um, uh, and I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about a lot of these places along the way, uh, and, uh, and so we'll, I'll, we'll see this again. Um, this is where it is right now, as we speak, um, right there. Uh, yeah. And uh, this is one of the first pictures that uh, Jira, uh, Curiosity did. It was done on uh, August in 2012, very shortly after it arrived, showing you get a feel for the kind of terrain that uh, Gale Crater has. Uh, this bump here, this hill is about 1,000 feet high, and that little bump right there is about the size of Curiosity itself. Um, this, is, uh, this is now Yellowknife Bay. This is where Curiosity spent seven of its first uh, five years, five and a half years here. It's been here because actually it achieved most of its stated objectives in this first seven months. It drilled these holes, um, uh, and Cumberland I mentioned, but these pictures are deceiving. Um, this is a half a meter, that space in here. So these are really looking very close to the ground, even though we're looking some distance away. So this is a... a, a, a a very wide angle kind of camera, and so we're seeing things up close, and then the distance, the stuff in the way back background is, is quite a bit further away. Uh, what they found or right here is that this is mostly mudstone containing 20% clay materials that clearly formed with contact with water, had to form from water. Um, there was, um, it was interesting about the water too, it was not acidic, um, as it's been seen, was seen by opportunity, but it's actually very neutral uh, of, a, of a lake and a potentially habitable environment. And in fact, it may have even been drinkable. So, so that, that was done very early on, uh, uh, but it spent seven months uh, here, not going very far. Uh, and this is another one of its major d discoveries. This is um, some gravel uh, on Earth that has been clearly the boulder, the rocks have been uh, uh, rounded by flowing water. Guess what? You, the same, you can see the same thing on Mars. So it's clearly uh, water has flown through here and rounded over these boulders. They estimate something like 10 to 100 centimeters a meter, uh, 10 to a meter deep water flowing through here over eons created these rounded, uh, very similar. Uh, this is one of the drill holes, uh, and uh, it's the existence of an ancient lake. What they're looking at is very, very fine uh, uh, mudstone here, indicative of uh, the bottom of a lake. And it uh, also shows these cracks that are filled with uh, sulfate uh, uh, material that uh, uh, formed in, in, in these cracks. And this is the kind of thing that they were hoping to be able to see. Um, and this is the analysis uh, from one of these. Um, and this was uh, uh, John, the John Klein site. But uh, it, it shows the uh, various, uh, it, it, it came up with signatures of more than 500 mass values were sampled, 500. And here's some of them, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, um, um, Two different forms of sulfur, a sulfide and a, and a uh, salt and a sulfur dioxide, both two forms of, uh, of sulfur in the same uh, place. And again, this is done over temperature. Uh, the other interesting thing was that the the other interesting thing was that the uh, ratio of deuterium deuterium to hydrogen deuterium is uh, is heavy water, and uh, and it's uh, uh, the de ratio of deuterium in the water here is three to one. Uh, on Earth, it's one to one. Currently, it's six to one. So what this tells the scientists, what, what, what tells the scientists that the atmosphere was once much more dense. And why does that tell them that? It's because 
deuterium is heavy and so it remains. Hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen is much lighter and it gets blown away by the, um, by the uh, solar wind from the sun after the magnetic field disappeared. And so uh, that ratio tells them that the atmosphere was much denser than it is uh, now uh, because of the predominance of deuterium to hydrogen. Uh, a quote from the chief, uh, 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 the chief uh, exec, uh, investigator of this project said, that, quote, the range of chemical ingredients is impressive and suggests pairings such as sulfates and sulfides that indicate a possible energy source for microorganisms, quote, unquote. Uh, they also, uh, one of the other major accomplishments uh, is they found organic matter. And so this was in the, um, Junk, the Cumberland Hole, the uh, green here, uh, and they found clear evidence of uh, chlorobenzene uh, in uh, the Cumberland sample. So this was the first time on Mars that anyone had seen uh, a, a organic compound. Okay, and so when they put this together, this is what they think was happening uh, at uh, the Yellowknife <coughs> site. There's a stream, uh, many streams, alluvial fan, layered hard rock, clays, and then higher up, sulfites uh, and uh, cemented fractures. So it's not clear exactly what happened, but they think it, it, it's either a, it either formed uh, a small lake or a, a, but thinking is is that the level of this lake probably changed over the eons uh, and it was intermittently wet. Okay, this is, this is a little break from uh, the geology. This is, um, uh, this is an eclipse of the sun. Uh, done by uh, Phobos, taken by uh, Curiosity uh, on, in 2013. So this is uh, this is the sun uh, with the, the the small irregular moon uh, uh, in front of it. This is also a picture of the Earth from Mars. And there's the Earth's moon, and there's the Earth. Uh, if the actual the actual picture is almost unrecognizable, there's the dot of the Earth right there. They've expanded it here. Pretty amazing. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, now Curiosity is done with Yellowknife and it's uh, moving away. Uh, this was uh, a high-rise picture taken uh, shortly after it left Yellowknife Bay and this is Curiosity's track. And it's about 10 feet apart. So I told you, well, we'll talk about this more later, but the resolution of this camera is amazing. So this is, it's looking at the tracks and, and that's 10 feet. Three meter, so, pretty amazing. Uh, this is now so we're away from uh, Yellowknife and we're on our journey. Uh, so Yellowknife was very successful, but took seven months. So Curiosity uh, was then trying to make up some time, covered six of the uh, next of uh, the ten kilometers in, in in the next year. So at ten kilometers, get to the base, it covered six in one year. Uh, this is a place called Dingo Gap, um, and again, these pictures are deceiving. Uh, this this little uh, snow, uh, this excuse me, sand dune here is about three feet high. These rocks are about two feet high. Uh, here, uh, this next picture. Okay, yeah, and I just show you where we are. So here's the uh, here's the yellow knife, uh, and uh, Dingo Gap is right here. So Saw 528, 528 days after landing, and we're going to see. We're going to talk about some of these other places as we go along here. Um, this is uh, the same place, you can see the track, and here's Curiosity itself. Um, this shows about one year of wear on the wheels, and uh, they were kind of chagrined by this and said, okay, we're going to have to go slower, we can't be going this fast, we're going to wreck the machine. And so uh, it's, uh, they slowed up the uh, progress a bit. Okay, so this is uh, the Kimberly, if you remember, that was on the... Uh, uh, that was on that map. Um, uh, Kimberly is uh, uh, is uh, evidence of a of a lake bed uh, that's uh, probably come and gone several times in the period of uh, about four billion years ago. Um, the, originally, they thought that this this basin was filled with dust and, and 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 filled in by wind. It's now based based on what we've learned. It's clear that about 150 to 200 meters of infilling has occurred due to uh, an ancient river and lake sediments over a period of less than 500 million years 
in, in, his, in uh, Mars's early history. But you look at this picture, and it could be almost, it could be in the Earth on Earth. I mean, uh, you know, where else would you see something like this? Could be in Death Valley, for example. Yeah, uh, Mar uh, Curiosity also found uh, methane, and at first they thought, well, wow, does that mean there's uh, uh, some uh, biology going on here, uh, microbes? But no, they're thinking that because of the uh, uh, the timing of it, it comes at a certain time of year that is due to UV radiation breaking down some chemicals and releasing uh, methane, some of the organics releasing methane. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting spot. We've now moved along. Uh, to this place, uh, Sol 705, uh, from Yellowknife Bay up here. And we're at a place called the Parham Hills, and they're right here. This is, by the way, another high-rise picture. Uh, and it's, uh, you can see it's all very broken up, uh, and uh, lots of topography here. Guess what? Curiosity doesn't go charging through. Okay. <coughs> this is the path. I, I hand draw this in. By the way, there's data. You have to study it. You can get this kind of data, but you have to dig into uh, uh, a lot of the JPL documents to find this. But I figured it out. And this is what it, it stuck its head into uh, uh, Hidden Valley on Sol 705. Then it made its way around here and, and around here. And it left this area in Sol 923. So if you do the math, that's, uh, that's 200 days. So it spent 200 days getting here. Now, in fairness, it spent a lot of time in here also, but uh, that gives you a feeling for how, uh, how fast this, is, uh, this, this thing is moving. Um, yeah, and the next picture, I think, is going, we're going to look into the Hidden Valley here. Uh, yeah, so this is, um, you can see uh, uh, clearly layers of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of rock, of um, sedimentary rock, uh, and these, these layers are indicative of being on a river delta where the layers are fairly thick uh, and uh, are, are, are formed because of uh, uh, waterborne sediments uh, 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 essentially landing and then drying out and then layer after layer after different water uh, filling events occur. This is a, another sample uh, you can see the scale here. This is again a half a meter here. So we're looking at. It looks like this thing must be huge, but it isn't. This is a half a meter distance here. This is even finer. This shows um, uh, sediments that are even finer, much finer, which are indicative of sediments at the bottom of a lake. And so you can see both of these uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the same area: the, the river delta set type of sediments and the finer sediments. Uh, this gives you, this, uh, this is uh, one of the things that you, if you want to figure out where curiosity is, you download these things. This is a 275 meters across, so it's not very far. This is in a high rise mesh. But this shows what curiosity was doing uh, in what was a pro approximately five months of jigging around here, and uh, where it was every one of these days. It spent three months, um, uh, or three weeks, excuse me, in one of these locations because it had a a failure of a short circuit that it had to figure out. But then it, it makes its way along uh, something called Artist Drive to the higher elevations. So this is the route that it's going to take, or has taken by now, um, through from the hills along. And the challenge here is to get through these um, sand dunes, because it doesn't want to get bogged down in the sand, so it has to find firmer. And it chooses this thing called Murray Buttes and uh, Murray Foundation. And eventually, it's going to end up up here on what's called the Hematite Ridge. Um, yeah, and uh, this just shows the bigger picture uh, one more time. And yeah, we're going to take a look uh, also in the next coming slides. We're going to see a place called Namib Dune. Uh, that'll be, uh, uh, and uh, we'll be seeing that. We'll be talking about the Mary Buttes and uh, Ogunku Beach in Maine right here. Okay, so this is a this is a um, uh, Marias Pass. I didn't that was in that same general area. I didn't point it out. Uh, this is a nonconformity. This shows uh, this mudstone that formed the base of uh, the uh, Gale Crater and sandstone uh, on top of it. Uh, and uh, so and here's Curiosity. But this, yeah, this is uh, looking for Marias Pass. I, I said I'd show it to you. Where is it? Well, uh, there it is, right there, the highest pass right there. 
Okay. Um, here's a, here's a curiosity again, another selfie. They did a drill hole here. Uh, you can see that's the top of Mount Sharp up there in the distance. And they actually drilled a hole here and they found uh, some unusual uh, silica material called tridentamite. And uh, it was only found on Earth uh, in, in, uh, uh, with very low pressure and extremely high temperatures, typically of an explosive silicon rich uh, eruption, something not seen before, and actually only seen in this one location, as you'll see, as uh, I'll show later. But uh, this, again, was one of the sites. This is now um, a study that, uh, uh, the very first time Curiosity is doing something that's never been done before. Almost everything it does has never been done before. But this is one of them. It's studying a sand dune. Uh, the first time anyone's looked at a sand dune on something other than uh, Earth. Uh, the scale here is again deceiving. This, uh, this dune is uh, 13 feet high, <laughs> is all. Uh, and uh, it's a part of this uh, Bagnall dunes that uh, runs along the base of uh, Mount Sharp. Uh, and so it's co conducting the first uh, uh, study of this. Uh, you can see the influence, the wind is blowing over the top up here and causing uh, grains of sand to come down to come down the face. Yeah, the, uh, the estimate is that because of the wind, these dunes are actually migrating about one yard or one meter uh, each Earth year. So quite a bit of movement, actually. Okay, so uh, here's, uh, here's Murray Buttes, and I mentioned we we're going to talk about Murray Buttes, um, because this is, this is how uh, 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 Curiosity gets out from the uh, base of uh, the crater uh, onto uh, the slopes of, uh, of Mont Char. And it finds this uh, area that gets it through it. These hills here are, these buttes as they call them, are about 100 meters across the larger ones and about 10 meters high. But this is the path that I trace through here. This is about one, one kilometer uh, of total distance. And so it, this was how it uh, decided. These, by the way, yeah, these pictures, th this stuff here is remnants of some of the dunes. So it finds a way through the dunes. This is a neat picture. Uh, this is a picture of that Curiosity has taken uh, on uh, August 5th, 2016. Uh, this is the fourth anniversary of its landing, by the way. And on this anniversary date, it took this picture. And this is its approaching these um, uh, Murray Dunes, uh, uh, Murray Buttes, excuse me, here. And these are about uh, these are about 300 feet away and about 50 feet high. But all pretty much all mudstone here. These buttes are uh, formations of that um, uh, probably are sandstone. Okay, so here's a cross section uh, that's been made uh, through this area that uh, Curiosity is going through, uh, from the bottom of the uh, crater uh, all the way up to this hematite ridge, and uh, so here it is. And you can see this Murray formation. Uh, uh, Goes along for quite a while. It's uh, it uh, the it's about 650 feet um, of elevation gain uh, just in the Murray Formation, and so it yeah it's uh, also these rocks are some of the oldest rocks that Curiosity will explore. And this next picture just sh uh, shows you a cartoon of uh, uh, exaggerated a little bit in steepness. But uh, this shows uh, where uh, Curiosity is at this moment in terms of its distance. It shows its height uh, and uh, the various um, uh, me uh, geo uh, geological uh, formations all on the way up. And sulfite units is as far as it can go. Its original mission ended in September of 2014. First extended mission ended two years later and is now into its third mission uh, and is uh, chugging along. As of this time, this date, which is uh, December of 2016, it climbed 540 feet and went 9.3 miles. So, that's yeah. So this is a meteorite, uh, iron-rich meteorite, about the size of a golf ball. This is a, a picture. Uh, now we're mo moved along. It's it's off the uh, base. It's now it, uh, we're no longer on the um, 
gale, uh, the base of Gale Crater. We're moving up the uh, hill. And uh, this is a composite image. It was taken on 9th of September. And you can see the rolling terrain. Uh, there's this iron ridge, what's called a hematite ridge uh, here. These, are, uh, these hills are uh, called are high in sulfates. And this is as far as uh, um, that curiosity is likely to go. This, just keep this picture in mind. I'm going to show you the next one. This is a year later, this next picture. So we're a lot closer to these um, sulfate units, you can see, and this, uh, uh, we're right in the middle, we're standing right in the middle of this hematite area. Uh, and this gives you some distances. This is three kilometers to here, 3.7, 18 uh, kilometers distance uh, to the very top of probably uh, Mount Sharp, which it is not going to get to. Uh, on the way from leaving here, it passes by this very interesting formation, which again is not as massive as it looks. It's 16 feet high. Um, this is sandstone, believe it or not, um, uh, even though the, the color is uh, very dark. And this is, these are mud, mudstone layers on uh, sandstone on top. This was made uh, just last year, about a year ago uh, uh, now, on Sol 1598. 41 images, by the way, I haven't really mentioned that. When you, these composites, you can see, they're shot, there are many pictures that are used. In this case, 41 separate pictures were made to, uh, taken to make this picture. So here we are, uh, that's Irison Hill right here. We come through and uh, we're proceeding on um, uh, up into this uh, hematite unit. It's also known as the Vera Rubin Ridge. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Vera Rubin Ridge. Um, uh, and it shows the again the, uh, the sedimentary layers. Each of these layers is about a one inch or several inches thick. This is a blow up uh, down here. There's also um, a, a white white rock that's in uh, in between, which is some kind of a calcium sulfate. So this is the this is where Curiosity is probably going to spend the rest of its time in investigating this uh, ridge. This is another more detailed picture taken on July 3rd uh, of these uh, sedimentary layers, cliffs, at the base of uh, the Vera Rubin Ridge. So here's a, a, a mineralogy from uh, Kevin. This is, these are all the various samples. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten samples that uh, Curiosity drilled and analyzed uh, in uh, Kevin uh, and Sam. And uh, you can see uh, the green here is uh, clay materials. So there was clay at the bottom, and then there's clay again uh, in the Murray Butte area. Um, there's uh, the other, uh, the other feature. Some of the other interesting features are uh, there's uh, silica material that I mentioned. This is this blue area here, only found here. Uh, it, it again is indicative of there's no silica anywhere else, but here it's indicative of some kind of uh, volcanic eruption. Uh, of silicon rich. Uh, other, other interesting things are uh, there's some other weird minerals. This blue uh, material here is called gero, gerosite, which is uh, 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 iron sulfate material that is formed at, um, uh, in areas of acidic water. And it's again only found in this part of the hill area. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the gray, which is prominent uh, up here, is. Uh, is uh, uh, mafic igneous materials, uh, silicon rich, or no, not silicon poor uh, igneous uh, materials, and that's that's true. Well, you can see that's true on the, the entire the entire way up the hill. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is a cartoon uh, that it's very likely that uh, Gale Crater held a lake, uh, and uh, this uh, I showed these already, but this just shows the the coarser sedimentary layers that are likely to be at the top and the finer sedimentary layers that are likely to be uh, at the bottom. Um, okay, back to this uh, same picture again. Um, we're up here now. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the end of the, almost the end of the story. Uh, this is now the 29th of uh, January, 2018. This is Virginia's birthday. This picture was taken in her honor. <laughs> And uh, you can see uh, Curiosity, this is a raw image, uh, unprocessed raw image. Uh, Curiosity's tracked on the Vera Rubin Ridge. Here's a self, another selfie <coughs> looking out towards the top of uh, Mount Sharp. 
Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we're at, this is the edge of Gale Crater, 25 miles away. So, okay, so this is, um, how are we doing in time? This is, um, uh, this is the panorama that it took. Uh, it got high enough that it could actually see the far wall and also see the journey it made from its landing site all over here. And there's, uh, if we can do this, uh, we're going to try to do a video. I um, hesitate, but we'll see if we can make this happen. Um, escape. And, all right, and then, let's see, somewhere in the browser here. I think we have preloaded. Yeah. And we're going to hit this. And then we're going to do this. When the Curiosity rover climbed a ridge and the skies cleared up during Martian winter, we had the chance to take this amazing panorama. And I'm really glad we did. Curiosity is inside Gale Crater, a huge basin made by an impactor about 3.8 billion years ago. The mountains across the crater floor are actually the northern rim of the crater. They rise over a mile above the rover. It's so clear when we took this image that you can even see a hill outside the crater that is 50 miles away. I love how you can see Peace Vallis, a channel that once held a flowing river, like many others that formed lakes inside Gale Crater. This is also the first time we could look back and see everywhere we've been so far in the mission since landing in 2012. Here's the path we took. After landing, we drove to Yellowknife Bay. Before we turned southwest through Darwin, Cooperstown, and the Kimberley. The rover studied dark, wind-blown sand at Namib Dune. Curiosity then weaved between the Murray Buttes, checked out Ireson Hill, and made a tricky crossing of the Bagnall Dunes before reaching the ridge where it sits today and caught this amazing view. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Okay, we'll go back to the uh, slideshow here, and I'm going to have to speed up. Um, but that's pretty much the end of the um, curiosity story. All right. There we go. <clears throat> um, yeah, in a summary, curiosity really succeeded in determining an awful lot of information. It, it, it clearly found existence for water, it's flowing water streams, lakes, and deltas. Uh, found ingredients for uh, uh, key ingredients for life, found organics energy source for possible uh, creation of micro, such as, since it sees a chemical reaction occurring between sulfides and sulfates. Drinkable water may have been present uh, in the, uh, with low salt, uh, low salt on the valley floor, and a huge amount of uh, geological diversity uh, with sand, dunes, volcanics, and many minerals. So it, did, it did pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna zip through this. Uh, this is uh, opportunity, and opportunity is now in fort, his 14th year, um, uh, just to remind you, it's here. Uh, Curiosity is over here. It's got the distance record. It's gone 26.6 miles. Um, and uh, it's uh, over twice what Curiosity has done. And uh, this shows where it, uh, it, it, it was, uh, Eagle Crater is where it landed. And it, it's now investigating Endeavor Crater. Um, this is the airbag that it landed on. Uh, and these are uh, hematite uh, blueberries, they call them, that are formed in contact, uh, iron-rich material formed in contact with water. Um, here's an uh, opportunity in Endurance Crater, uh, looking at the sidewall. Here's a picture it took of the blueberries. Isn't this an amazing picture? This is the blueberries on the bottom of Endurance Crater. Uh, this is another crater on the way um, to uh, Endeavor Crater. This is Victoria Crater. Uh, this is a picture taken by High Rise looking down at Victoria Crater. Pretty amazing. Mm. Uh, it is now uh, on the edge of Endure Endeavor Crater and is going down. It's going to go down into Endeavor Crater through something called Perseverance uh, Valley on its four 
1,654th Martian day. And this is, uh, again, a picture taken on the 26th of January. So this, you can go on these websites and follow this blow by blow. Okay, so this is a picture of the, um, high ri of the Mars Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter with this incredible telescope uh, that's in orbit. This thing is, uh, has, can image, you can see, we are seeing resolutions far better than four to eight feet. We are seeing uh, much better than that. This is now a talk about water um, on, on Mars. And uh, these are, this is a picture taken by Curiosity. And these were forever. Uh, Ten, nine, eight, okay. so, Mr. Nation. six, five, four, three, two. Uh -oh. to boost your engine, cut off at separation, two and a half minutes in the flight. Reports show that the M1D engine performance is nominal. Okay, unexpected uh, bonus. <laughs> okay. Um, that was that was a bonus that took off just this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just There's a happened. Tesla Roadster on its way to Mars. <laughs> so, uh, as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted. Uh, these are called recurrent slope lineae, and until uh, this month, uh, or maybe two months, they were thought to be water that condensed during the winter and then uh, salty water and then flowed in the warmer months. They've looked at this much more carefully now, and they now believe it's actually sand. It's, it's, it's actually debris coming down uh, in the warmer months. But this is data that's it's just months old. Um, this is another fantastic picture of the Valles Marineris of the same kind of uh, patterns uh, that you can see, but just beautiful pictures. Uh, this is a picture of the, um, uh, remember I, I briefly talked about the Phoenix Lander. This is ice underneath the, one of the pads of the Phoenix Lander. And this is it's a couple of days later, and you can see some of it is actually gone. There are also changes in some of these uh, channels in a pattern of several years. This is, these are two pictures separated by several years. Um, Water, most of the water are in the poles. Uh, this is an uh, image of the South Pole taken by the uh, ESA Express Orbiter. Um, and they, they've uh, looked at this. They determined that 85% of what you're seeing here is carbon dioxide. The rest of it is, uh, is water. But when they looked at the scarps around it and the slopes beyond it, uh, a lot of buried water was found. And the estimate here is that uh, between all of this, it there's a, an equivalent layer of water of 11 meters. In other words, if all the water was taken here and distributed uniformly across uh, the uh, Mars, it would be 11 meters thick, uh, or 1.6 million cubic kilometers. This is now the uh, North Pole, uh, uh, and uh, with this huge uh, chasm uh, here, and uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, this is a, this chasm is a couple of uh, kilometers and almost a mile deep. This is a high-rise picture of the scarp at the base of that chasm. Um, pretty amazing. The, the bluish material is ice. Um, the uh, this is a cross section taken from that same uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter using shallow. It has a, a shallow radar unit, Sherat, and I don't know how shallow, but they've managed to determine two kilometers worth of ice. Now, this is a radius, so it's about a thousand uh, kilometers wide, but two kilometers of ice, so a lot of ice. Um, and, you know, I say it's more than on the South Pole, but when they add all the, that they've recently found on the South Pole, it's 1.7 million kilometers here on the north, and that compares to 2.85 million kilometers for the Greenland ice cap. So there's a lot of ice here. Uh, you know, it's, it's within a factor of two of the... Uh, amount of ice in the Greenland ice cap. Together, when you add the two together, we're now up to 23 meters of water across the surface of Mars. This is a picture taken by high rise of, uh, of, uh, of, of buried ice. And uh, in a, this, this is, I think uh, it says here up what the scale is. Um, yeah, yeah, 100 kilometers. And it's uh, in, in the north, 
It's in the north. Yeah, 100 kilometers right there. Yeah, this is a, this is data that was just uh, just published in January 12th of this year. But this shows seven uh, uh, using the same Sherrod radar. radar they've determined they've looked at these ice scarps on seven different eight different places, and they've made cross sections of them. And these scarps are about 100 meters thick. So it shows that there's ice not just at the poles, but in the mid latitudes. And uh, uh, and this uh, and then now I'm going to show you some more data that was taken in, uh, within the last two years. There's a massive amount of ice here, and there's a massive amount of ice here. And uh, this is uh, this was taken uh, again by, interestingly enough, looking at uh, depressions uh, of of this of this region, and, and again using the uh, shallow radar, uh, and they determined that uh, there's there's quite a bit of uh, water. Yeah, in, in, this, in these two regions, added together, together with the poles, it's now estimated that there's five million cubic kilometers of ice on Mars, which comes out to a global equivalent layer of three, of 35 meters, 150 feet. So this again is very, so what we're seeing is data in the last two years showing that there's ice not just on the poles, but it's buried in these, uh, ten, uh, in these uh, uh, layers. Now this is the this is very interesting. Um, this is now trying to say, all right, well, how much ice might have there? How much water might have been on uh, Mars way back when, uh, back at the beginning? And what this is, remember, I talked about uh, the uh, deuterium hydrogen ratio. Well, from analyzing meteorites, and that's what this data is, it shows that that ratio was very close to unity back at the beginning of time, as far as Mars and uh, we're concerned as well. There, here's, a piece, here's a piece of data where that DH ratio is three. Uh, that, uh, or this is three billion years, but three, the actual, this is what um, uh, uh, Curiosity determined. This is modern measurements, uh, actually from the Earth of, uh, of, uh, of the atmosphere in uh, Mars, and uh, it's about eight. And what this tells them is that there was as much as six times the amount of water at this time early on, as there, and it disappeared rapidly, by the way, uh, and then uh, sloping off gradually. And this rapid drop is associated at the time when the atmosphere disappeared on Mars. But this is real data, and it, it pretty clearly shows that there's a, there's a lot more water on Mars early on, and this kind of is a cartoon showing that it most likely was in the northern hemisphere. And this translates to this global average depth now of 137 meters which would occupy 19% of the uh, surface, mostly in the northern, in that big basin. And I said, don't think about that as blue as ocean. Well, it might, may have once been ocean. Uh, this compares to 16% of area occupied by the Atlantic Ocean on Earth, and 71% for the Earth as a whole. So Mars wasn't as wet as the Earth, but it, was, uh, it wasn't anywhere near as dry as it is now. Other measurements were, have been done recently looking for a natural shoreline, and this shows a, a shoreline of, at an elevation of minus 2,500 uh, 2, meters in the northern plain here that had a pretty consistent level all around the entire uh, northern area. And if that was filled with water, that would be 124 million cubic kilometers and that would be, if it was all filled, it would be 36% of the Mars was covered and uh, it would be a global layer of 550 kilometers. So this, um, so it's the, the true answer is somewhere in between these, but uh, 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 this would also be the watershed for such an ocean that large, and this shows you the, the shoreline of what it would have been, uh, would cover 75% of the planet. Uh, so, uh, Evidence strongly suggests that uh, in addition to the fact that we have all this water, there had, for this water to exist, the planet had to be much warmer and have a thick uh, atmosphere. Uh, and it's, it, what they now feel is that the atmosphere um, uh, wouldn't have been, it, what would bring that atmosphere in play would be eruptions from these volcanoes. And uh, when, when, analyze, when you're look, and looking at these various hydrogen deuterium ratios, uh, it supports the fact that it really was uh, there. And then the question is, where did the water go? Well, a fair amount of it's still there. 
And uh, these are measurements by this Odyssey uh, spacecraft. And the, the areas give you uh, shallow water, and uh, the red area here is 18%. Uh, these are the polar areas, much higher amounts. Um, and so some of the water is definitely still around. Um, but another point that's made is that um, most of the rock on Mars is basalt. And it can be chemically altered by water present. And uh, sulfate deposits found by opportunity could contain 22% of the water by weight. So there could be a lot more water buried in the actual uh, planet that isn't, as, isn't in form of ice, but it's still there. Uh, so that's another place where the water could have gone. But the bulk of it undoubtedly got disappeared uh, by the sputtering once the magnetic field disappeared. And this is just a series of cartoons showing how we got from here to here. Um, water summary, I pretty much covered that. I have a few pictures uh, I was going to show. Uh, the that's the rest of this. Is uh, This shows this um, uh, Valles Marineris, and uh, this is how it lines up if it was on the United States. So it's way bigger than the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's over 4,000 kilometers, 600 kilometers across, and 8 kilometers deep, in comparison to the Grand Canyon, 800 kilometers, 30 kilometers across, and 1.8 kilometers deep. Uh, this is a, some amazing pictures, uh, infrared pictures, um, uh, of uh, some of the detailed parts of this Valles Marineris, and it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, these are, this is a high-rise picture showing seasonal uh, carbon dioxide frost in the north. This is about a kilometer across. Uh, these are all about a kilometer across. This looks like raindrops, but this is a kilometer across, and this is olivine-rich uh, sand dunes. Um, these are uh, sedimentary uh, layers uh, that, uh, again, this is an actual picture. Um, this is uh, uh, solid carbon dioxide that's being, uh, in the warmer months, <coughs> is being evaporated. Lots and lots of, uh, of, uh, of surface detail showing these channels. Um, amazing picture here of uh, collapsed material that is running down uh, due to carbon dioxide frost evaporating. Um, this is actually a avalanche that, that high-rise caught. Uh, this is a crater that didn't exist uh, uh, in 2010 and it was, uh, uh, it was uh, photographed in 2012. These are more of these slope, uh, these uh, path areas where various debris came down the slopes. This was taken actually by the ESA for the South Pole. Um, these uh, uh, interesting gullies, again, are more frost uh, at the end of the season. And I don't have any of my own pictures uh, of Mars or of, of, uh, or, uh, of uh, Pluto, but I have a, my own solar system picture. Here's the, uh, uh, here's the solar eclipse, and here's a picture of our moon. Yeah. And if you want to, later on, uh, up here, um, I actually have some prints of this, uh, metal prints that are actually pretty nice if I do say so myself. Anyway, that's it. <laughs>
I didn't give that talk. I'm going to give it at the rec center on Thursday at 6.30. And the reason I mention it to this group, we have, it's quite likely there will be a field trip to New Zealand next year. So if you want us to get a preview of what New Zealand looks like and a possible field trip, uh, come to the rec center on uh, next, uh, thir this coming Thursday at 6.30. Anyway. Okay. So I, I think they have to be. Yeah, they yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and wind and this, uh, the, the movement of this part of, is a problem for these rollers too, because they uh, this sand and stuff accumulates uh, on them. And uh, they go to, uh, you know, particularly the frost in the winter, they turn these things upside down. They do go to great lengths to try to preserve uh, and keep them working. Like, it's amazing, opportunity 14 years uh, 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 is still going. And uh, Curiosity is, is uh, five and a half years into it. Is or was there plate tectonics on Mars? No. No, no water, no plate tectonics. Just it's uh, nothing. Nothing is happening. It's just pretty much uh, a dead planet at this point. Obviously, a lot happened at one time when there, all that water was there, but nothing is happening. Yeah, there's no plate tectonics. Uh, John, oh, correct me. I don't think there's plate tectonics on any of the planets other than Earth. Uh, there's some marginal evidence that there might have been a bit early on Mars. Okay. They think about okay. and when there was the water there, yeah. And there is actually on some of the uh, moons. On the moons, it's ice plate tectonics. Yeah. 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 What's the gravity on Mars relative to uh, the Earth? Forty percent. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, you showed all the different countries that are exploring Mars. Yes. Uh, do the Russians and all the other countries? Uh, share their data with us? I think so, uh, although right now there aren't any Russian um, uh, uh, missions there, but uh, one of that, that neutron device that's on Curiosity was made by uh, Russian, the Russians, so they, they actually made that instrument. So they participated in this. And as you can see, there was a, a sharing of, uh, um, there's a close cooperation with the European ESA and NASA. Uh, sharing information as well. There's plans, I mean, this isn't over, by the way. There are plans for a lot more missions to Mars in the next years to come. I mean, all sorts of countries doing it. And uh, um, uh, India, China, uh, the U.S. is going to put another rover on, uh, bigger and better than Curiosity, in 2020, if, if the budget holds, I suppose. But, uh, no. But uh, yeah, it's, it's going to use some of this part, the spare parts for Curiosity to save money. So some of the instruments that are currently on Curiosity, the, uh, the spare parts for that are going to be used on this uh, new rover. Uh, yeah. Did you say there were no meteor kits on the surface of Pluto? Oh no, only on that in that one area, because uh, yeah, there's uh, and. That area is uh, constantly being rejuvenated. There might have been meteor bits, but they have been smoothed over. So it says that it's continuously being smoothed over. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Any more? No? Yeah. I don't get no, all you have to do, by the way, yeah, all you have to do, by the way, if you want to know information, you want to see these pictures, uh, I, I'll make my talk available, but all you have to do is go on to the websites, and JPL, all these pictures from High Rise are available on JPL websites, so you just go and you can, get, you can see them all. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice, our tax dollars that work. This is what it is. So one other question, so it seems remarkable to me that Pluto, which is so far away with so little energy from the sun, has liquid water yeah. under its surface, and it's such a small body. Yes. Whereas Mars, which is much larger, yeah. has no liquid water. Yeah, it's all evaporated. Yeah. Because it because of its, it, its location in, in in the solar system. If Mars, you know, Pluto was where Mars is, it wouldn't have it probably wouldn't have water either. So it just seems so much less. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also just the temperature 
I mean, Pluto is, well, yeah, that's a, that's a conundrum, though. I mean, it's temperature, but the water is there. It's just buried. And there's heat. There's actually, it's probably it's thought to be radioactive heat that's in, in, somehow embedded in Pluto that's actually generating the heat. But do you think Mars would have, have the same thing? Just like the Earth, though. Yeah. There was a lot more water further out in the solar system. Yes, that's right. In fact, they're thinking because of this discuss, semi discovery on Pluto, there's evidence now, there's pretty well strong thinking that there are buried layers of water on some of the moons that are in uh, you know, Jupiter and Saturn. There, this is probably not that uncommon a thing. So, if, there, if there's no other questions, uh, before we do the chair thing, I just want to mention. In two weeks, uh, Dr. Alexis Alt will be here, and she's going to be talking about basically new technology that's being used to look at the Wasatch Fault, 